Welcome to this Q&A session for the film Meanwhile on Earth, which is part of the 31st edition of the Nordisk Panorama Film Festival. The film is nominated for Best Nordic Documentary, but uh, remember it can also win an audience award, so please uh, remember to vote online after this session. My name is Cecilia Ledin, and I will be the, Q and, the host of this Q&A, and I have the pleasure of talking with Carl Ulsson, who is the director of the film Meanwhile on Earth. Welcome, Carl. Thank you, thank you. And thank Hello. you for doing this. Thanks. Can I just uh, start by saying that thank you for yet another amazing film from your hand, Carl, uh, which I will say you have a very um, specific and consist consistent uh, cinematic uh, style, um, which is always really inspiring to watch. But we'll talk more about maybe your artistic choices in a bit. I think we should start by, or I will start by asking you, uh, the subject matter, you know, how did you come to want to make a film about undertakers and that whole world of... Uh... Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually started with, with another film that I did before in which I had some, a couple of scenes that was from a crematorium. And there was, when I saw that material or those scenes from there, there was something, there was a very like strong clash between something very trivial, those guys were going around whistling and, and um, make, making obscene jokes and so on. So they, and at the same time, there was something in their work that was very existential and very like big for me at least. Uh, so, and I think from the beginning, I was kind of like provoked about that. Is it, is it allowed to whistle when you're shoving coffins into an oven and so on? Uh, and, and, and that kind of provocation or, was quite quickly turned to me myself. Was it me? Because of course they were their everyday life. Uh, but was it me that had a kind of a strange uh, relationship to death or, or, or to the existential in general, maybe? Um, so, and maybe also our society and our culture. So that is, those thoughts kind of inspired me to, to continue and see if it was possible to make a whole film with that uh, conflict or that uh, contrast as its foundation. So, yeah, my, ne my next question would be, I mean, it, it, is, it is almost like a stigma, isn't it? The whole undertaking world. And I noticed in, your, in some of the descriptions I've read about it, it's, it's called the death industry. And, and I have to say, watching your film, it felt much more like a calling than an industry. I mean, it might be mundane what they're doing and it looks very trivial, but somehow they seem to do it with so much respect and dignity. This was at least mm -hmm. my feeling. Uh, but as you said, you did something before, but I was wondering about access. I mean, how did you get access to, to all these uh, institutions and people doing this job? Yeah, it was quite, kind of a, as it usually is, a lot of, a lot of research and, and just meeting a lot of people working with. I, I, from the beginning, I didn't know all the different roles uh, that was in this business. So I, so I also had to figure out what kind of, what kind of rooms are there because I'm, I think it's very interesting with where the, the physical places they're in. Uh, so what kind of rooms and what kind of different persons and different roles are there. Uh, and then when I figured that out, I tried to meet as many as possible in a geographic area, of course, because I couldn't go around to all Sweden uh, making it. Uh, so I wanted them also to be kind of in the same city or the feeling that everybody is in the same city at least. Uh, so, so then I just started talking with a lot and then you fall in love in some of the persons and this is something very interesting with this person or this person and so on. So then we like pick them together. <laughs> but it was, never, it was never really a problem. It was some bureaucratic problem with, uh, with getting access to filming at uh, specifically morgues. Um, um, so we had to like buy trust from other people that wasn't in the film, not the participant, but other bosses and stuff in the, in, in, um, in the municipality and so on. So we had some work with that, but it was always when we, when we got that, that respect from them in some way that they know that we weren't, because the dangerous part of this is if you film someone that can be recognized that is deceased. Exactly. Because of course, then we need uh, the family or uh, to agree on it. So our rule for ourselves was always that we should film it in a way which don't uh, leave out their, their yeah. Uh, who it is or some personal information and so on. So, so when, when the bosses 
uh, of those uh, different places understood that that we're gonna stick to this rule uh, it was kind of open for us yeah I, I noticed you in the end wrote that all names that have been used were fictitious because that was the only moment I reacted to be quite honest was when the urns are put in the ground and, and names are, are mentioned and I thought oh my goodness but I, I thought that was very reassuring at the end yeah, see that. But we did the scene, and then she actually read the names. But then we—I know from the beginning we we can't use. But it was such a nice uh, scene in some way that we are, in the end, we're just a name that's going down uh, that on a list. Uh, so I went out and came up with other names, and then we went out to record it again. Uh, the, the whole film has just this wonderful quality of you feel like you're being backstage all the time of so it's so on the one hand it's this very mundane uh, and and in some instances it can feel crude is probably the wrong word but you know it's it's tough to watch them work with the bodies and as you say it's it's, it's every day it's a job for them but on the other hand they're kind of staging it for us the people that that maybe don't want to deal with it and it's very beautifully shown when we see them how they built up the moments before the funeral with such, a, a, you know, accurate test, the way he's measuring, so the coffin is in the right way and stuff like that. I'm curious about your choice of rooms. I mean, because I guess they're the obvious rooms, but then there are some other rooms. I mean, how, how did you choose where, where the setting would be? It is, um, yeah, from different, different rules. It, one thing is that we have a rule so that we, we're gonna film in, in uh, the rooms in a certain way, and not all the films are possible to film in that way. So, so that was a limitation, of course, that I couldn't film in all the rooms uh, that I wanted maybe to do. But then, then I had this, for me also, it was interesting to have this backstage uh, or to keep up with this backstage uh, uh, approach. Because I, I think we all know we have someone close to us that has, been, has died and, and we, are, we know how it is to sit in the, the uh, chapel or the, the church or whatever it could be. Uh, so that room is... Yeah, we know about that. Uh, so it was much more interesting to see what we not normally are, are watching. Um, so I guess that, that was, yeah, uh, that it was drawn to, to that kind of room. So I just have one scene, I think. But yeah, we put one scene in the film, which ex is actually front stage when, when uh, the um, a flute player that has been practicing on her uh, is playing uh, a melody like front stage at a funeral. Oh, that's that right. is that is that is so we wanted that break at one point but otherwise it's there was a rule also for us that it was always supposed to be backstage uh, and with them yeah so so, so, so <laughs> it's 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 wonderful to see a film as i say that has this has this very strict rules uh, applied to it and at the same time you're able to kind of convey a very emotional journey, I, I find. Uh, I'm curious about, about uh, so, so the staging is clear. We can see that you put the frame, you put up the camera. I, I know that you have staged this, but uh, how much is given up to chance? I mean, besides what you do with the framing, how much have, have you asked them to do? Or are things just happening in front of the camera by chance? Or what, what is your level of control? But this is, for me, this is the, the most interesting part of, of documentary film, I think, how, how much can I, because I'm very interested in, in formalizing it or, or make it um, um, as I want it in some way, but how much can I press their reality and still at the same time keep the authenticity of the, the characters. So it's always a back and forth and kind of a dance with them. How much can I control without destroying it? Because mm -hmm. I, I do it sometimes, I destroy it and then I can see it directly that it doesn't work or they, they don't get normal or natural if I stage it too much. So, but uh, generally I don't, I don't uh, um, direct dialogue. So, so none of the dialogues are, that is all, yeah. Happens. Uh, yeah, happening. And that is also, I, I need to keep a space for the fantastic to happen because I can't come up with, with the things they are saying. It's much more interesting in, than, or for me at least, than anything I can come up with. Uh, and that's also the charm of, of documentary cinema, I think. So, so I, I, we have talked, it's, it's different from different situations and different scenes. Some of the scenes um, is a very short thing that's going to happen. Someone's going to play the flute, for example, and then we set up that scene, and that is very set up in, in some way. 
but then we have, for example, the drivers that are going to drive back and forth to Lund uh, from Malmö, for example. We, have, we know that we have a distance that they're going to do it, so it's going to take half an hour or something. So we set up the camera and film all the scene. Mm. Uh, that gets them some more time. It's an easier scene in that way because it gets them more time to forget about the camera and forget about the situation. Uh, so it, that kind of scenes, then also those scenes that are more, uh, that I say, go so to speak. And then, and then of course, the skill is, is the duration of, of each scene uh, as it unfolds in the film, which is done in editing. And, and it, it, it's just, uh, just to mention your, your latest film, Patrimonium, or the film before this one. I mean, it had the same strength that you see, you're watching something where nothing happens, and then the moment comes where, where the humor comes into the picture, or at least something happens, and often it's something uh, humorous. And could you, could you reflect a bit about how you balance this, I would say, kind of serious topic, nonetheless. Maybe it's because we're kind of worried about death in the Nordic countries, but how you combine it with, with humor. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I know, but I think I, humor is a method, uh, and in, in other films uh, I've done and are doing as well, uh, because I think that humor is, that's what makes us relate to the characters or creates empathy with them, because I think it comes when, when we recognize ourselves in them. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's something that someone I know could have said or whatever. It usually yeah, comes from there. So it gives some, some warmth and some connection between the characters and, and the audience, I think. Uh, so it's a very important part. And I think in this film, maybe it's also the contrast in the scene between this existential and the, the uh, trivial, because I think we have some idea that this, those spaces are are free from, from everyday life and free from trivial matters. Uh, and when they are not, we think it's a bit weird or, or we don't know how to really react on it. Um, so it was, of course, even more in this, I think it was, it was important to work with this, uh, with the humorous part. Yeah, so, so, the, so the context is what makes it funny in a way. I mean, more than what is said, it's where it's said and when it's said, basically. Yeah. yeah, and the, the humanness in it in some way, I think, because I, I think or I uh, have experienced that, that however I put up a scene or how I create the scene, it's going to come something that is human or something that we can relate to in that scene. If I'm there long enough, it's going to come something. Uh, from it, they're going to say something that is interesting or, or, or funny. And usually when those human things or that we recognize ourselves in are in a bit, in a way funny in some way or another. Uh, so I think it's, it just comes natural in a way that those are the scenes that we pick in the editing process. Um, yeah. There are a few characters I was curious about because they seem to be, you know, I, I was wondering how you put them into the story. The ones that are not directly related to the, the work function, the bingo yeah. players, uh, the karaoke singing, the old lady. Um, yeah. How did they get into the film? I had the, I had the idea from the beginning that I uh, would have some one character uh, that was a, like a visitor in this industry of some way, that, that, that could be a representative of us that is from the outside in some way. Uh, so that's where Jan, uh, the, uh, the son, uh, comes in. So I was looking for someone that had a mother that was in the end of, end of the life, uh, yeah, was close to death in some way. Uh, so, yeah, he was thought out to be like that. And it also becomes a representative of the loneliness uh, or the human loneliness that, that, that you might feel in that situation. So it was important to get that element in also uh, to have someone else uh, yeah, that have a real, maybe uh, something, um, potential grief. Um, and the other, episode, so he's one of those that kind of breaks the rule with that we all in, like all the scenes are in this, uh, this environment or this world or this business. Um, but I, I felt quite quickly also that I needed something else to, to because I think when we come into it, we're looking at it um, with a kind of um, uh, alienated way of looking at it. We see it uh, as something that we haven't seen before. But I think when we have seen a couple of scenes with it, we, we, um, we learn to know the place and then it becomes 
uh, normal, natural. Uh, so to keep this kind of alienated glasses on, I needed to get us out of that world so that we can go into it again, if that gives sense. I needed something to draw us away. Yeah. And that could be, so I wanted some scenes that had, uh, that was weakly related to the, uh, the story or the, um, the, the world or the business, but not directly. So also the audience could get maybe surprised and activated again so that they can see that world with new eyes over and again. Uh, so there was also the bingo. Uh, it's, it's a place in Malmö where, I, where, where I've been before and it was also, it usually was an ambulance uh, outside because uh, I was living quite close to there because it's, it's old people that are, that are playing bingo usually. Mm. So it usually happened that, that somebody died in there or fell, I don't know. So it was a place and I think that that room was, was interesting and I also thought that um, yeah, it might be the waiting room for death. Waiting room, yeah, and plus it gives, as you say, food, it, it gives some pauses it gives some good breaks in, in, the, mm. in the otherwise pretty clear, clear story. Yeah, so it was a structural uh, element in some way. I needed it for the structure. Uh, to, but, but, but then I think one can have different interpretation of it. But that was my idea with it, that it, it's related in some way, but quite weak. Yeah. And, and talking about structure, maybe a few words about the editing, because... I mean, it's clear that you have full command of the images and you, and you structure your, your storytelling in, in the process of making the film or producing it or filming it. But mm. what about in the editing phase? Uh, how, how much control do you have there and how much is mm. a dialogue, which it always, of course always is with your editor? A lot, a lot of dialogue with the editor. Uh, we, from the editing phase, we're doing everything together, kind of. So, uh, but it is a very difficult editing process. I, I'm doing, uh, I'm kind of scripting the, the film from the beginning, but the, all the scenes, but the, uh, how the puzzle will be in the end is, is quite difficult to see in the beginning. I have some ideas, but it's, it's very open. And I think we shuffled it around a million of times before we got the, and it's kind of difficult editing process because if, if we change one scene and put it here and, and because it's so big blocks that we are moving around, we can't nerd around with one scene too, too long because we don't edit in the scenes. So it's all about shuffling them around and then you, we get in blind very quick. Uh, so we need to see everything from the beginning to see if it works as a, a poetic structure. Also because it's not a, a, a development in that way. Exactly. So we need to just feel if it feels right. And, and then we get in blind very quick. Uh, so it is a kind of tricky process. Um, but yeah, we are, it's a lot of discussions all the time and we, we're coming up with, with ideas, how it could be different. And then we're doing it again, seeing it again. So. Yeah, so, so the, freedom, the freedom of chronology and, and, and plot and all that makes it in a way a, a big challenge uh, to find another, another way to structure it. A lot. Yeah, it's, yeah. I think it's the most difficult type of films to edit uh, yeah, because I, don't, I can't hang up on something. We have some, uh, some, I have some kind of structural ideas. We have some music parts with pauses and so on and, and some kind of a musical structure instead that we talked a lot about. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that either. So, yeah, we try to it up on something but mostly it's how it feels and when you when you have the energy and when you get a surprise and so on mm. um, but i have a good editor and yes. we're working with, with with the same and she we've been working together for since film school so so i think we both have the a bit knowledge now of how we can structure those kind of films you've kind of formed your your own film language together in a way yes yeah. in a way yeah it's very yeah. Nice. Carl, a final question is, is, of course, about the characters. Have they seen the film and, and their reactions? And that's always fun to hear. Yeah, I, they, they saw it quite early. Uh, um, also, I showed them bits and pieces uh, of it uh, early on. So, but, the, but everybody have, has liked the film. I think it was, for some uh, of them, it has been important to... Uh, it's actually been like, a, they think it's important to show, show this, <laughs> this place because they all have the idea that, that we are kind of distant or alienated from this, uh, from the notion of death or in our society. So, 
So I think from them meeting it so much every day that maybe have a bit more relaxed relationship to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, many of them think it's important to, to, to show it also to that people get more like involved in what's coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're certainly doing that. You're, you're helping demystifying a lot of things. But still, I think you're showing the work they're doing. They're doing it with a lot of respect and dignity, which I found was, was, was really important for me, at least seeing it. Yeah. Yeah, Carl, yeah, Carl, really. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for doing this. And thank you for the wonderful film. Thank and you. thanks to everybody that's been watching this. And remember all the other great films at Nordisk Panorama and to vote for the Audience Award. Thank you very much.